calm the storm that surrounds me With just one word the darkness has to retreat With just one touch I feel the presence of hell can't do. Amen, amen, amen. I don't care how big you think your problem is. That's right. My God is bigger. Amen, yeah. My God is bigger. And I'm not going to put my faith and my trust in anything else. Amen. Amen. God amen. has proven himself so many times in my life, and I know he's done some in yours too. Amen. 
Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, oh, and I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, yeah, you are my hiding place, oh.
loving you, Lord. Yes, I do. The way, the truth, the lie, I believe you are. The way, the truth, story Your faithfulness is walk beside me The winter storm made way for spring yeah. In every season from where I am standing I see the evidence of your goodness all over Promises in fulfillment yeah. all over my life, all over my life. Sing it again. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment. song last night brother Sam gave part of his testimony and I remember growing up in church and I remember especially when I came to Cornerstone years ago 
all these gang members getting saved and all these ex getting saved and all this former getting saved and everything. And I'm glad. I'm glad. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. But then the Lord reminded me of something. You see, I'm one of those good boys. Never got in trouble. Never been to jail. All right. Never had a drug problem. We still love you. We still love me anyway. <laughs> Never been a drinker. I've been a stinker, but not a drinker. But it made me look back over my life and the evidence that God has been with me. I tell you one thing I know. I know there have been accidents that I should have been dead. I know that there have been times the enemy has attacked, and I should have been not here. I should have been gone. But God, say that, but God. Every one of us have a but God in our life. No matter if you're serving the Lord tonight full force, You've been doing it for years, whether you just got saved or whether you're right now in the balance. I'm telling you, but God so loved this world that he gave his only son that whosoever would believe on him should have everlasting life. That's why I thank God for the evidence, not only for the changing power that God does, but for the keeping power that God has. Can I get an amen tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. So no matter what our past looks like, Come on. this song we can all sing with the same meaning behind it. Amen. Yeah. Oh, how great is our God. Sing with me how great. And oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me how great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great.
You know, gentlemen, no matter um, where we look, I see Egypt. I see my past everywhere. Same with you. Everywhere you look, we see our past. We see everything. We, we're still exposed to it, and the devil tried to put it in our face in a, in a, in a different way to get you to, uh, to touch it or just smell that thing a little bit. And, and, and we're exposed to it all the time. You know, but when I hear some of you guys' a testimony, testimonies of other family members, some of them are a lot different because some are real extreme where God took people out of. Some are like, you got to be kidding me. You know, you got you to gotta be kidding me that you were doing that before. You were involved in that, and you're, now you're serving the Lord the way you're serving God now, even though we still go through our struggles. You know, to, to be able to see the evidence of the hand of God, nobody get the glory for that. Only Jesus, only the Father get the glory for that. Because I call that, back in the days, bondage, even if we thought we were doing good. Even if we thought we were making money, we had a good job, and going to the clubs and stuff, even thought we were, you know, we were still in bondage. You know, some of us were in bondage with, 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 with addiction, with alcohol, or pornography, or perversions, or the desire for strange flesh, or we just, our marriages were tore up, or whatever. We were in bondage in one form or another, and the Lord has taken many of us out of those bondages in a great and a powerful way. And for some of you, you're, you're in the beginning process of that, in the decision you made for Christ, and, uh, and you're, you're, you're going through that time right now of, of where the Lord is pulling things out, and you're seeing the changes in your life. You're seeing God move um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, because as you remember the story of Egypt with those that are in slavery, um, they were in bondage, and they were in bondage for 400 years. And if you look at how many generations were born and, and, and died within 400 years, that's a lot. Just in 100 years, I mean, just stop, think, stop thinking about yourself. You know, how many, your dad, your grandpa, and all them that were born in their 30s or 20s, and then, you know, for 100 years, how many generations you could have in 100 years in your own family? Imagine 400 years. They'd be like you, your grandpa, your grandpa before you, and your tata abuelito, and then all your, your, your kids, your, their kids, their kids. All were born in slavery. That's how it was in Egypt. They were all born uh, in slavery. And for many of us, I mean, for them in Egypt, they lost a lot of stuff while they were in slavery. They were owned. 
But same thing with us. When we were in slavery serving the devil, we thought we had it good, but we lost. We, the devil took some stuff from us when we were in slavery. When we were in Egypt, the devil took some stuff. And we just let him. A lot of, a lot of us, a lot of, a lot of folks, they, the, the devil took our marriage and we let him. Yeah, the devil took our kids. I don't mean kill them, but our relationships with them. Yeah, and, 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 and some of, the, some of the, um, the hearts that we broke, the minds that we destroyed with our own kids because we allowed the devil to do that while we were in slavery, while we were in bondage. You know, we, in bondage and in slavery, a lot of crazy stuff happened. You know, many of us lost our relationship with our children. Like I say, we left scars on our loved ones. And while many of us, you've heard me say this before, are still paying the price physically for some of the things that we did in times past. We might be saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, but some of us are still paying the physical price over it with our kidneys and our livers and our minds and our, our body, our joints and our body and our, our heart. And we're paying for it physically, you know, many times, and we've been delivered. But some of us are still feeling the result of the times that we lived in Egypt. And when the Lord brought the Egyptians out of, out of bondage, he wanted to give them back what the devil had taken. He wanted to give them back what, which, which God had promised them a long time ago. He wanted to give them the, uh, the land that he promised them. He wanted them to flourish. He wanted them to prosper. Um, and he wanted to give them the land back when, when he got them out of Egypt, but a lot of that land that God had promised them, the land of milk and honey, was already occupied. Stay with me. It was already occupied, and God wanted to give them the land of milk and honey, but they couldn't, um, they couldn't get back to that land because it was already occupied. Now, one of them, that piece of land that was there, was the city of Jericho. I want to talk about Jericho for a minute. So Joshua chapter 6. If you've got your Bibles, you know, follow with me. It's a very, very familiar passage of how um, the story uh, of the defeat of the city of Jericho uh, by the Israelites where the walls, very familiar, there are always songs they're saying about it, the children, everything, where the walls came crashing down. A very, very familiar, familiar story. But tonight I want, I want to look at the method, uh, the process God used uh, to bring that victory forth, to be able to defeat Jericho. So now going back a little bit, to, you won't see it on the screen yet, but Joshua chapter 5 tells us that the, uh, the Israelites were already camped outside of the city walls of Jericho. So I want to start with chapter 6, where they're camped out outside the walls of Jericho. So Joshua chapter 6, uh, verse number 1. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its kings and its fighting men. So I believe right here that the men thought that all of a sudden, because the Lord said, I delivered the kings and all the fighting men, that those gates were just going to all of a sudden fall down right in front of them, or the gates were just going to open up right in front of them, right then and there, and they were just going to walk right in. Because it says, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, and the Lord said that. So I believe those men that, 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 that they were spoken that way too, they said, oh, this is cool. I'm going to kick it right here. And, 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 and Jericho is going to be delivered to us. So the Lord told Joshua that the city, it's yours. But how is that city mine when I'm still standing outside the walls and the walls are still up and I don't have access to the city that you say is mine? How is that mine that you're saying, but yet I'm standing right here and I don't see the results of it yet? How is that possible? Because the Israelites were still camped outside the city. But it's okay, Lord, if you say so. We're going to wait right here. We're going to sit right here. We're going to wait right here until you bring me the victory, Lord. I'm going to wait right here. You said. Your word said. So I'm going to wait right here until you bring me the victory. You know, the Lord has always given, I know, I've read the end of the book. The Lord has always, 
have give, has given us the victory. He's given us our victory in our marriage and reality, in our very personal issues that we deal with that nobody that we think that nobody else knows about. Our struggles that we go through on a daily basis. But many times when we're going through our struggles, those walls are up, we sit back and we're waiting on God to deliver us in reality. He, the, the, he, we're waiting for God to deliver us the victory with no effort of our own. But you said, and we're wanting God to just deliver us of all this mess and all these walls that are before us and for God to just do it because you said, acting like God is Uber Eats or something or DoorDash. Bring it. I don't want to get in the car. Bring it to me. Yeah, bring me the victory, Lord. Just, but, but you said, God. Right then and there, when the Lord gave me the passage, I put right there, you need to go get it. You see, the Lord gave them a, a, a process of what they had to do in order to receive the victory that he promised them. Because all they heard is, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to give you the city. The city's yours. I'm the kings and the fighting men. Everybody, it's yours. Okay, but yet they didn't see anything take place. So this is verse number three. He said, march around the city once with all the armed men. Once again, talking to Joshua, all the Israelites. March around the city once with all the armed men. March around the city with the armed men too? Mm. That's a lot of men. And you wanted to bring weapons? You said you were giving me the city. You said that wall in my marriage was coming down. You said that wall was coming down with that addiction. You said that wall was coming down with those issues I'm dealing with. You want me to show up with all the men that are armed? Hmm. I'm going to have to fight for my victory? I'm going to have to march? I got to bring weapons? Hmm. God, you just told me that you have delivered Jericho into our hands. Along with all the kings and all the fighting men. It doesn't make sense, God. Why am I not seeing the victory in my life right now when you have promised me that? But okay, I'm going to do it. I'll get all the men, I'll get all the weapons, and we'll march around the city. We'll march around the entire city once, just like you said. We'll march around the city once, just like you said. And the Lord said, the second half of three said, do this for six days. Six days? You know, many times we have issues with our children, our family, our marriages, and we don't want to fast for nobody. God says, I need you to fast for a week. Fast for six days. You want to see a miracle? Start fasting. What do you mean fast? I'm going to wait right here, God, until you bring me the miracle. She needs to come back and say, sorry. My employer needs to give me a raise. My doctor needs to tell me he made a mistake with that, the result, saying that I was sick this way and I'm not. Yeah. You said that you were going to give me, and you say now you want me to do this for six days? Now listen, don't miss it. This was the only instruction that God had given him up to this point. Right after that, Joshua gives instructions to the priests to start marching. So I'm going to jump forward to the actual battle, the seventh day and the seventh march around the city. Now we're at verse number four. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a, when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the walls of the city will collapse and the people will go up. Every man straight in. You say, when all this happens... The walls are going to come down. They're going to collapse. 
And every man is going to just go right on in. So I'm going down Joshua chapter 6, verse number 16. The seventh day, the seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Verse number 20 now. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout. Now, once again, let me stop right here. Right up to here, this is the instructions that the Lord had given them. Because many times in, in, the, in the process of God doing something in our life, we fail to understand why the Lord is doing this with me this way. Why is he, why is he doing this in my life like this? I don't agree with the way the Lord is doing this. You see, many times if we're just waiting for the hand of God to move, waiting for the miracle, you've got no skin in the game. Yeah. We just want God to fix everything around us, and me have not, I don't have, I don't have to do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Like me, I'm 100% for deliverance. I'm 100% for that. But let me tell you what I'm, what I'm, what I'm in favor even more. That person needs to just start saying no. The scripture is very clear. When the spirit of the living God is inside of you, there ain't no foul spirit that can be inside. Well, I'm a Christian. My name is in the land book of life, but, but I still cuss. You need to stop doing that. I, I love Jesus, but I still want to, uh, I still want to go to the club. I'm not going to just don't go to the club. Lay hands on me that I don't want to gamble. Don't let your wife give you no money. There's some things that you, just, you and I just need to stop doing. Waiting for God as Uber Eats, show up, give me the victory, and I got no skin in the game. Just do what you got to do, God. With no effort of my own. Just do it. We're waiting for, for God, and we don't understand why God is allowing this process. You've heard me say this before. You know, many times the, the Lord will allow your car to break down. Why? For some reason, he wants you on the bus. And will complain and gripe and kick and buck. And you know what? You'll be humble because you have to ask for rides or you have to be, you have to be on a bike. You'll be, you'll be, God says, I'm doing this for a reason. Because you've been prideful over here in this other area. And I'm going to deal with, but God, you said you would give me the victory. I don't need a bus pass. I need a brand new truck. God says, no, you're getting a bus pass. I don't like the way you're doing that. Why do I got to say sorry? Hmm. Second half of verse 20, 620. When the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. You see, every day in our, in, our, in our walk with God on this journey, on this march, we're faithful into the things of God, but yet many times we're, these walls are still there. We've marched one time, but we're still there. I'm tired already. We marched once, and I'm still tired, and I, I've marched twice, and I've, I've read the Bible. I've been seeking God, and and it's still there. The wall, the giants are still there. I've marched three times and I've done this and I've done that, but the problems are still there. I believe that's why God said seven. I, the Bible doesn't say this, so I'm not adding to it. But I would, I, I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I would bet that. I bet you there's some folk that would say, you know what? I've already done this four times. I'm done. This is my fifth march. I ain't seen nothing. And God said, and you're a fool for still marching. And you're marching, you're carrying your shield and your sword, you got all that gear on? I, I, I'm not doing that anymore. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden you've been, you've been seeking God and you've been, you've been saying, Lord, I've been marching, I've been doing this and I've been faithful in ministry and tithes and I've been helping people and I've been, I've been, I've been reading your word and seeking God and and this is the fourth time, fifth. I've marched six times. All of a sudden, uh, on a specific time, all of a sudden, you begin to see that wall come down like you've never seen before. 
All of a sudden, your children are saying, Dad, can I talk to you? Your wife says, you know what? I'm sorry for the way I acted. You know something? I, I just didn't understand some stuff. You begin to have a discernment for, for things that, that were tearing you up in ministry and in life. You're mad at people and things are going on and you're holding grudges and all this happening. And all of a sudden, on the seventh day of the march, you're saying, man, I understand some stuff now. I didn't understand at the sixth day of the march. But on the seventh day, I'm seeing something like I've never seen it before. And you see that wall come down. You begin to have a discernment you didn't have on day six. But on day seven, you have a discernment. Now you understand some stuff and you say, I can't believe I kicked them buck and I got mad at the pastor and people. I can't believe that I was disgruntled. I can't believe I was thinking like that. On day seven, I see this coming down. Because they stood fast. Stay with me. Watch it. I'm going to mess somebody up right now. Going on with verse 20. When the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed, watch this, and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. The Lord told them, I've given you the city, and everything in it. But you still have to fight. You still have to march. You still have to carry your weapon. You still have to do all that. The Lord says, I've given you your marriage back, but you're not standing in victory because you don't know how to, you don't know how to say sorry. You don't know how to admit that you're wrong. You don't, know, you don't have the discernment to understand that your marriage is not based on a feeling or an emotion. I might not even love her right now. I might not have feelings for her right now, but I know who I am in Christ in obedience and to the word of God. Yeah. And the Lord says, I've given you the victory to heal your heart and your mind over pornography, but you're the one that has to stop looking at that thing. I've given you that victory, but you're the one that's got to march about that thing. You're the one that has to have skin in this game. You're the one that has to say no. You're the one that has to put that thing down. Because I've given you the victory. <laughs> I've given you the victory over anger. I've given you that victory over anger that you had all your life, even as a child. But you're the one that's going to have to control your tongue. Dang it. I've given you that victory. But you're the one that's got to march march. You're the one that's going to have to control that anger. Just because you're saved and, 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 and you love Jesus doesn't mean people can say, oh, that's a man of God. I'm never going to do anything to offend him again. I'm not going to say nothing to get him mad. I'm going to be kind to him and just love that brother. Shoot. When you, when the, not you, not people, but when the Lord acknowledges you as, as, as with, like we talked about with, with, with Enoch, when he identifies you, when it pleases God, you're going to see people coming against you. Even religious folk are going to come against you. We're thinking, we're thinking, that it's, that it's, no, 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 no. If I love God, everything's going to be good, and everybody's going to be good to me and nice, and they're going to want to bless me. When you're identified as a man of God, doing your best to live holy before God, you become enemy. And the average Christian folk can say, well, I can't believe he's teaching the class. I can't believe he's doing the Bible study, and I can't believe they let that dude have a mic, and I've been here 15 years. Yeah. It's the craziest thing. But, but I'm a man of God. Welcome to the ministry, brother. The Lord says, I've already given you the victory over the addiction. You're the one that has to say no. You're the one that has to erase that, delete that connection's number from your phone. You're going to want to be the one to stop going to that liquor store that you always, Ooh, I just went in for a soda. Yeah. 
but that's the same store you've been going into back when you were in Egypt. And they, hey, they know you by name. Oh, I just came in here for a, a seven up. Are you with me? Or am I talking to some blind, spiritual blind folk? See, no matter the wall, no matter the storm, no matter what giant it is, no matter what wall, no matter what is before you, you're the one that's got to make the decision within the process. And when God is with you, watch this, when God is with you, those victories are so easy to make and to, to decisions compared to how you were trying to fix things when you were in Egypt. You couldn't because you were in slavery, you were in bondage, and you try to fix family stuff. You try to fix mom and dad stuff and children's stuff while you're in bondage and slavery, but it just didn't work out no matter what you did. Oh, she'll never leave me. <laughs> she'll never leave me. All of a sudden, from one day to another, boom, gone. <laughs> Just facts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's, here's the key right here. I'm going to close with this. Joshua chapter 6, verse 4. I'm going backwards. He said, have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in the front of the ark. See, because we missed it when I first said that. It's the third time reading it. See, wherever the ark of the covenant was taken, they had total victory, victory because the presence of God was with them. The Lord was telling them, I'm with you. And I'm going I'm I'm to go with you. You're going to get victory. But you need to go in front. He said, you need to go first. No, God, you, uh, uh, you go first. You go in front. That giant, I can't take it. I can't deal with that mess anymore. I need you. My dependency is upon you. He said, had seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark of the presence of God. God was saying, I'll give you 100% victory and I will be with you, but you need to go first. He said, I'll give you that victory, but you need to go first and do what you got to do first. You need to fight. You need to march. You need to quit grumbling. You need to control that tongue. You need to say sorry. You go first, and I will be right behind you. We're wanting God to go first. God says, you go first. He goes, if you go first, he goes, I'll come behind you and make everything happen as you go first, and you're going to witness the walls come down. And that's exactly what happened. They were instructed for the priest to go first. And the Ark of the Covenant behind them, they marched, they blew the trumpet, and the walls came tumbling down. We just have a problem in going first because we don't want to, we don't want to help clean up the mess that we made. We want God to clean up all the mess. God ain't no maid. Don't get me wrong. He'll fix relationships. He'll restore marriage. He'll do all of that. But you know, how, let me say this. I'm going to close with this. I'll use a marriage. See, we're wanting God to, when we, when we pray for our marriage, we're wanting God to, to when we pray, that God's going to just jump on her when she just thinks she's going to wake up saying, I'm so sorry, get on her knees in front of you. I'm so sorry. You're going to forgive me for everything I've done. And, you know, I'm gonna, and just kiss your foot. We're wanting God to just, and we pray that way. And we pray almost as, as, in a way that well, God's going to send a pastor that's Holy Ghost filled. He's going to talk to her and she's going to be like, oh my God. That pastor opened my eyes. He says some things and now I understand about you, honey. Or, 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 or you know, I, had, I, I woke up from a dream and oh my God, you're the best man I've ever met and you're the handsomest and big old panza. You're the most cut and you're strong. And... Wrong. 
we're, we're wanting in our prayers to God to, to fix that mess. God says, okay, I'm gonna answer your prayer. I'm gonna fix, I'm gonna fix her. I'm gonna fix your marriage. I'm gonna fix your kids. I'm gonna fix your, I'm gonna fix your finance. I'm gonna fix that mess. Go right into the room where she's at. She's still mad at you, though. But I'm going to fix it. Rubber big old foot. Oh. What do you mean rubber foot? Yeah. Go rubber, size 12 foot. Just rub it. <laughs> what do you mean march? What do you mean Fight. Go in there and tell her you're sorry. No, but I've been praying that you would go first and fix it. I'm fixing it. The man, the Bible says, is the priest of the household. He says, and I'm calling for the priest to go first. So you have to go in and do what you got to do first. And I'm going to be right behind you. But I don't want to march. I don't want to say that. How could I tell my kids I was wrong? Yeah. How could I do that? How could, how could I fix that? How could, how could I do that? I said, you're going to have to. He says the priest has to go before the ark of the covenant where the presence of God dwells. That's why we move in ministry in all, kind, all different directions in ministry. And we're still tore up. Yeah. We're still moving in all directions in ministry and we're still tore up because we fail to understand our position as a priest that we go first. Yeah. Imagine if we understood that. That we go first. See, we're thinking that God's going to all of a sudden show up an angel and just wipe everybody out. God says, no, you go first and fight. Yeah. Say that. You do that. And I'll be right behind you and I'll make everything go on. Because you can go first but you can't make those walls come down. You can, you, can, you can be ready for it. He says, but because I'm with you, you're going to see those things that you've been dealing with since you were a child. You're going to begin to witness a victory that no man could ever give you. You're going to begin to witness things of the hand of God in your life you have not experienced because you think I've always been a dope and I'm always gonna, I've always been an alcoholic. I'm always going to be one. That's a lie from hell. That's a lie from hell. So if you think that you're going to walk with God with no skin in the game, I don't know what Bible you got. I don't know, I don't know who you're listening to, but you're going to have to be the one. Yeah. When you get not close to this, what time is it? Move that big old that thing away from front of that. I can't even see the time. Okay. When, when, when I was standing back, I go back to the prayer and just kind of concentrate a little bit. And, and all of a sudden, you guys started picking up all the tables and putting everything away. All of a sudden, before I, I was talk, talking to this, before I turned around, it was done. I was like, these brothers, and I, there was another brother. I said, these guys, look what they did. I could look at it. They got it down, and nobody was giving instruction. They were like, boom, 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 boom. And a change took place when everybody came together. Everything yeah. began to happen. You see, some of those, some of the, some of the, some of the, you priests that are that are going first, God has already blessed you. Like I tell you, right? God has blessed my marriage and my kids. God, I'm blessed of God. I'm, I'm and I, I'm careful with that. To honor God and to thank Him for that all the time. I got an awesome wife. I ain't got. I'll tell you right here. I'm gonna tell you right here, in the name of Jesus. I ain't got no issues with my wife. Zero. You might not believe it, but we don't fight. I'm telling you, we might disagree. I'm a soccer. No, I'm just kidding. We don't. We don't. He's still there. 
The lights are still on in there. We don't got no issues like that. Yeah. Yeah. But because I do my best to go first. But sometimes I'm like, you, you, you need to say sorry first. God says, no. She's not been called to be the priest. I've not called the female to be the priest. I've not called her to go before me. Stay with me. Because I've not called the female to be in front of me. I've called the priest. So if you got balls, you qualify. If you don't, you're in the wrong ministry tonight, brothers. You hear, what, you, hear, you hear what the Lord is saying? You need to come to an understanding to understand that you're the priest. If you think you're going to be perfect, you're not. Even the Levitical priest, the one high priest that would go in the car, the, I mean, the one in the presence of God once a year, they had to prepare him all year for that one time. The other priest didn't get to go in. But the Lord still acknowledged them as priests, but they took care of the altar. They took care of the, 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 the sacrifices. They prepared everything, cleaned it, and the fire, the, the incense. They took care of all the, the, the curtains and the tassels. They took care of all the outer court stuff. And God still honored them as priests. But, even the, but the priests that got to go in the presence of God back in those days had to prepare all year to go in the presence of God. So just because God calls you a priest, I'm going to tell you like this. He didn't qualify the man to be in God's presence because he was a priest. He had to qualify for it. But when Jesus shed his blood on the cross of